Welcome to Insight, produced in partnership with Howard University's WHUT. Today we are chatting with Paula Thompson, Executive Director of Voices for a Second Chance. Paula has generously agreed to share some of her experience with us. I'd like to thank you, Paula, for joining us today. Thank you for having me. So Voices for a Second Chance gives voice to people in their most vulnerable circumstance. Talk about that circumstance. In a quick nutshell, what we do is we bridge the gap from incarceration to community uh, for tens of thousands of district residents, and we've been doing that for close to 50 years. Uh, we work directly with uh, men and women in the D.C. jail, as well as um, citizens who are returning home from federal prisons from across the country. And um, what we do is unique in the sense that, well, for us, we view reentry as starting at the point of arrest. And we meet with those men and women when they've been detained and do a quick assessment and help them through the, the, the sometimes confusing and the worry of being incarcerated. Um, and not only do we help their families navigate, um, help them navigate through the system, we also help their families um, with their absence from the home. How do you actually approach an individual, how do you how do you approach the family? Well, you know, we have an, a, an advantage in the sense that we work directly inside the jail, so we meet them where they are, and if they've been detained in the jail system, then we're able to meet with them one on one, just like you and I are sitting here having a conversation. We're meeting them just like that and having a conversation with them about you know, how long are they gonna be there? And I think that there's a misnomer that everyone in the jail has been sentenced, they have not. Um, we work with a huge amount of clients who are pre-trial. So many of them cannot afford to be bonded out while they're waiting um, to go to trial. Oh, so you're, you actually get involved during that, that uh, phase Absolutely. before? Absolutely, Absolutely, and so I think that's why it's so, that's why it's so important when we, when we describe what we do, it's really at the point of arrest or at the point of detaining. Uh, so, they could be sentenced in, in, um, in the process of getting ready to serve um, time, or they could be waiting to, for, to, for the determination of whatever their fate may be. So some people are there waiting um, to be seen by a judge, or some people are there because of a parole violation. It just varies, and many people are there who shouldn't be there. And so we have that conversation with them to see what it, why they're there and how can we help them during their time. Talk about how you interact with the criminal justice authorities, the people who um, are in authority, and the people over whom they, they uh, have control. And how does that relationship work with you acting as a type of intermediary? We're trusted on both sides. So we're trusted because we're not government. Um, we, we are a private organization. So we're not led by bureaucracy. However, um, because we are very knowledgeable and experienced in this space, where the correctional staff may not be, then that's when we come in. I mean, for example, we conduct um, groups for women um, in the jail, and that helps the, the correctional staff keep down um, conflict, mm -hmm. um, because now they have a space to talk about whatever those frustrations are. Um, and so we try to be that intermediary in there to help provide um, necessary comfort, in a sense, um, to, to clients who are being detained. And at the same time, we're hoping our example is also teaching the correctional staff how to maybe have more empathy for um, um, someone who is in that circumstance. And, and you're helping people to modify their own behavior, mm -hmm. giving them a safe space in which, as you say, they can work through their issues because so much of what has led to that point has to do with behaviors, interactions amongst people. Mm -hmm. You're actually helping, helping people before they leave uh, the setting to work through how they can behave outside of the setting of a jail or of, a, of the prison system. Absolutely, and at the same time, just going back to the intergenerational piece, is the fact that we're also trying to influence policymakers too, that the policies that they are determining and that they are creating impact real people. And so, yes, we do see generations, so, you know, most of the time we're working with at least two to three generations within a family. Mm -hmm. and 
th that speaks to, I think, policy and where the investment is and where our government puts their investments in, in um, a population. Many, I would say 90% of the people that we see come from impoverished environments, high crime, um, I would say substantial um, violence and substance abuse and a lot of um, disillusion. And so you can't think that it passes from one generation of unemployment or illiteracy, where you're in a system where people are being passed through who cannot read, who cannot write. Right. And so um, they, you put them out there and they're unskilled and then you tell them to go get a skill. And then we're living in a city that is consistently changing and they don't see a place for themselves. And when you have deficient literacy mm -hmm. and, you, and you have uh, behavioral habits that are very difficult to um, bring into certain environments, it's, it's impossible, it's just impossible to say, go get a skill, go get a job. Absolutely, absolutely, and um, we stand firm on that. And for those, for, for some of our clients who are coming home after doing 20, 30 years of consistent incarceration. We have clients who had been incarcerated since they were 17 years old and they come back to the city 30 years later and they're middle aged but they have no skills. And so the expectation is you have to get a job and you have to find housing. And you can't go to public housing because if you have a felony, you can't live in public housing. And if, if you're unskilled and there aren't any jobs for you, then, then what do you do? And then you're, you have a timeline in order to meet, to meet those requirements. And if you don't, then you're, you're going to be reincarcerated because now you're in parole violation. So you have a system that is not encouraging for success for someone who has paid their debt to society, but yet they're still paying that debt to society. So you, have a, you almost have a machine mm -hmm. that, that replicates behavior and encourages mm -hmm. behavior to be replicated that is destructive and has no reward mm -mm. for behavior that is uh, not destructive. Even housing, if you do not have any housing, then, house, then prison provides housing. Absolutely, and we have people who will return for just that reason. So um, we talked about when people are entering the criminal justice mm -hmm. system. Let's focus a little bit more on people who are exiting the criminal justice system. There you have um, a whole series of issues for the individual leaving, mostly men, uh, leaving the, the, the criminal justice system. They are confronting a whole set of realities. Their families are also confronting a set of realities. How does that, how, how do you help the families and uh, the people coming out of prison find a way to move forward together? Uh, well, family is, is key to um, clients being able to be successful. For returning citizens to be successful, they have to have a support system. Um, we, we continue the process of working with families while our clients have are being incarcerated. Um, for instance, we have a program that we are, this is our fifth year, where we partner with um, Stanton Elementary School. It's a, a DC public school in Ward 8. Um, it also, it has the highest rate of, in, of children of incarcerated parents um, attend that school. And so we started a support group there for children um, for that they can have a safe space where they could talk about that absence and that grief. Um, because that, that population of kids are ignored um, and that we have seen, and, and research states that you start seeing behavioral changes right. Um, during that stage, and it's because of the absence of the parent. And so we make sure that we connect that child, keep the child and the parent connected as much as possible, but also provide support to the custodial guardian or, or parent who, is, who has to be um, both parents or have to be that leader or that support system for the child while the parent is gone away. And so I think people people forget whether, some, whether a parent has committed a crime or not, they're still a parent. And they have a child that still loves them. And they, they both need to still have that connection during that process because it makes both parties um, stronger. What have we done? What, why are we at this point that, that we have so many people who go through this despairing process, commit crimes, then 
are incarcerated for lengthy periods, have families that are not taken care of, whose children uh, suffer this emotional damage, what can we do differently? Uh, we have to have an honest conversation about why this, the population, um, which is people of color, um, primarily African-American people who are um, incarcerated at a much higher rate and looking at the crimes that they're incarcerated for, we have to have an honest conversation on why that is. And there, um, I, uh, there have been, I think every administration has been guilty of it, of their part of not providing resources and making um, and implementing policies that have been damaging um, to the population. I think we have to be honest about that. And where racism and um, plays a significant role, because so when I talk about the fact that most of our clients are poor, and, and when I've had to, to have conversations with people to tell them about what's needed, you know, no one wakes up in the morning and say, I want to commit a crime today because you know what, what the outcome of that is. People are in survival mode. And I don't, and that population is so discarded. It's as if they are invisible people. I mean, here in Washington, D.C. is a tale of two cities. I mean, we, we see um, development everywhere. We see um, millions of dollars um, put in and invested by companies, and then you can go directly across the bridge, and people don't go over there. And we and you see dead bodies. You see our children that we work with; they're walking to school in war zones, and no one's talking about that. Not that they don't know it exists; they don't care. They are not. They don't vote. They don't have resources, they're not homeowners, and so they are discarded, and they know that. And so the recourse is, I have to survive, I have children. We have people who come into our office for our reentry service. We have fathers who come in with their children because they can't afford childcare. But they're trying to look for a job, they're trying to um, get resources so they can feed their family. These are the profiles of the people that you don't see but you see the opposite of that. But there are more of what I'm talking about that we work with, that people just want a fair chance to create a life um, so that their children can grow up to be the best that they can be. Paula Thompson, thank you so much for sharing the work of Voices for a Second Chance. Thank you for and having me. Thank you so much for your insights.